All right, here we are, a Thursday edition, absolutely beautiful weather in western Montana. Hopefully you've got your radio with you, whether you're using your radio pop or your traditional terrestrial radio. I'm Peter Christian, that's John King. That's right, I use my celestial radio. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> that's because he's a star. <laughs> okay, anyway, so we have a special uh, guest in studio today. That's right, we've got Bill Merrill in. He's with the uh, Montana Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife. Did I get that right? That's correct. All right, that's, that's more than five words in a row well, that John he, got in the right order. Neat, the cool thing is, Bill, and, and you guys have been here for the last couple of years announcing your special events that are going on and, and the various things that you've been working on. So tell me what's going on. Why, why are you here in our studio today? Well, I, I think this is the, the third year in a row that I've been in with you and John at this point. So we're excited just to just to make one more trip around the sun, so to speak, as sportsmen for fish and wildlife. Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. We are, uh, we're actually in our sixth year now, and this uh, upcoming event this Saturday will be our sixth annual pig roast, uh, live and silent auction, and uh, family-friendly events. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, one of the things I wanted to get into, because I had a surprising conversation with Bill before the show started about all the stuff they've been working on. and They don't really uh, write or draft legislation or, or lobby for legislation, but you're heavily involved in Montana sports and recreation. And some of that happens at the legislature, obviously. That's where the laws get made. So, so I wanted to get some feedback from you, what you think of uh, the uh, current legislative session. What went well for you guys? Well, I, I think that any time your, your elected officials or what I like to refer to as our employees uh, kind of do the will of the people in, in terms of what's good for wildlife, access, Montana sportsmen, you know, on our hunting and fishing heritage, I think it was a successful session. And it certainly feels like that um, as, as this one kind of comes around the corner here. But um, as you mentioned, we don't, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization and we're 100% volunteer. And that's a little bit how we're different than the Elk Foundation or the Mule Deer Foundation or some of the other big game groups that are out there. So we, we essentially, you know, have a membership, and when we send out an action item and say, hey, this is why this is good for sportsmen or bad for sportsmen, they'll take action on that. They'll contact their, their local representatives or local senators, and they will, they'll, they'll jump on that and let them know how we feel about it. So um, grassroots effort. Now, Bill, I, I got to ask you, um, in, in, my, in my work as a, as a radio news reporter, and I, I read a lot of news every day, that's what I do, and, and whenever I come across a story about wildlife or conservation or whatever, there, there's, there's one of two words that is included. It's either a conservation group or an environmental group, okay? <laughs> so are, are you guys, are you a conservation group or are you an environmental group? Because environmental group brings up the image of going to going to court suing you know uh, you know the, the, all this kind of stuff uh, and and conservation groups we go out and buy land for uh, for elk and other you know wildlife to be able to go out so we can go out and kill them and shoot them and put their heads on the wall I'm I mean conservationist <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, what, what where would you put Montana sportsman for fish and wildlife that's that's such a great question Peter um, <clears throat> and I think a lot of people you know there there really is a distinction between sound conservation and what we call eco-terrorists or environmental groups. And I don't like to pigeonhole all environmental groups as eco-terrorists, but many of the groups that are out there now have become professional litigators. Now, now what, do you mean, what do you mean by eco-terrorists? Eco-terrorists. Um, let's see. Well, Sierra Club last year or in the last couple of years has built a massive war chest of over $50 million dollars you know, in the bank for what they view as their environmental efforts. However, groups like that, the Center for Biodiversity, Defenders of Wildlife, those types of groups are notorious for shutting off major watersheds and shutting off access. You know, there's a huge thing in the, in the uh, United States Congress right now to relist the sage grouse uh, we you know, know about this well. We uh, talked about it all day. Yes. I think you guys got uh, got a pretty good handle on this. But if that happens, it shuts off vast tracts of public land and opportunities for uh, hunters and the public to access their, their public lands. So uh, what I like to refer to, our group is a conservation group. And 
I refer to us more as a sportsman group, really. Um, we're for sportsmen. We're for the hunting, fishing, and trapping heritage. And we want to make sure that that's passed down to our children. So we are definitely hunters and fishermen and trapper first when it comes to uh, conserving the elk herds, public access, and making sure there's a lot of opportunity out there for the next generation. I, I wanted to talk to you quickly about trapping. That's something that uh, had a mysterious workings machinations at the legislature this year, specifically when it got past the House and Senate. Tell us a little bit about the trapping bill. Well, the trapping bill, which was one that we openly supported, uh, essentially made sure that the words trapping were included as a means of harvest for wildlife in Montana. And essentially, you know, it's in our Montana constitution and a lot of people don't know that. And by doing this and, and getting that, uh, that bill actually passed, the governor decided to take no action on that, which to me was probably more of a publicity stunt just to uh, kind of appease the, the left or what we call the environmentalists. But he took no action on that because it had huge bipartisan support through both houses. And it, so it went into law. He, vo he voted present es essentially on this bill. <laughs> Correct. So it, it still went into law. And what it does is it, it guarantees our right to trap in Montana. And it makes sure that some of those eco-terrorist groups out there can't do ballot box biology, which is what I like to call it. Let's get a ballot initiative going forward that says, hey, nobody can trap on public lands. Well, that's like saying, well, nobody can fish in public waters. You just, you don't do that. That's not good biology. It's not sound science. So well, no one can pee in the public pool. Nobody can pee in you the public pool. You can't stop that. That's, that's going right. to happen. So, you know, trapping is our most effective means to control um, coyotes wolves, um, all the different types of predators that are out there that, that uh, affect our big game herds. So essentially, essentially what, we w what we did was back that bill with several other groups, and now it's, it's a guaranteed form of, of harvest in Montana, and hopefully it will negate any of this ballot box biology. Now let me ask you this. Do, does this have anything to do? Because one, one thing, we have a, a faithful caller to our show, Mike, Every time there's a politician on, asks specifically if uh, the Constitution, if, we, if they can add the word trapping to the Constitution as, mm -hmm. as a viable means of harvest. And, and we're up against a break, so I believe Mike might be on the phone. Is that right? Uh, that is Mike, yeah. Okay. Well, so yeah. we're going to get Mike and Jim, and uh, we're talking with Bill Merrill, Montana Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife. And we have one line open to give away some coffee. That's right. While I've got you trapped, <laughs> I will give you some free stuff. All right. It's even better than being in a real trap. Uh, we're going to give away some coffee, <laughs> some toast, and uh, your choice of spreads, all courtesy of our Rocket Coffee Stand, which is in the Garden City Garden Supply across from the Eastgate Shopping Center. Really tough gig here, kids. You have to do absolutely nothing except for dial a number, and you win this coffee. First one. 721-1290 is the number. First one gets the prize. 721-1290. And we're back on Talkback. Now, we had a winner just a second ago, right? That's right. Bruce yeah. won some free coffee. You can, too. We'll be giving away more tomorrow, but not on Saturday. No. Because Peter and I kind of have a life. Kind of. <laughs> Actually, I have a really fun life on Saturday. I'm going to see dinosaurs. I'm probably going to run five the 5K with the giant bouncy house and the giant bouncy slide and all that stuff with my daughter. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're running at 1230, by the way, in the Insane Inflatables 5K. So if you want to watch... Uh, what is mostly obesity bobble through a bouncy house uh, you, you can enjoy that with, uh, you, you, with everybody you, else you get the double bounce yeah right right uh, <laughs> so twelve thirty, run if you want to join us and it should All be right. a lot of fun so let, let's get mike on the line mike thanks for holding you're on with bill merrill from montana sportsman for fish and wildlife hi yeah well hi bill uh, this uh 212 bill you're talking about do you really think it's going to stand up in court do you, do you think the, the, the bill is going to stand up in court, Mike asks? Uh, I think what's going to happen is there may be some challenges and we'll probably see some appeals. But with that much bipartisan support and being signed into law, I absolutely do. I think yeah, that Montanans, that I, I think that Montanans well, have had it. Hang, hang, hang on, hang, hang on, Bill. Well, hold on for a mic. Mike. Mike, he can't hear you. Yet. Hang on. He's, he's got his headphones on. So it's, go, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. There you go. Yeah. Now, isn't this the law supposed to be changing the word, the, adding the word trapping to the Constitution, the way I understand it? I never did understand 12. That Bill, I've read it a dozen times. I still don't know what the dang thing says. 
It's kind of like Obamacare, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's about the most complicated piece of garbage I've read, and I'll put it straightforward. <laughs> and, and the truth of the matter is, the trappers had an excellent chance of getting a real constitutional amendment put on the ballot, but they didn't pursue it. It scared them to death. Well, and I, I think what we're going to see is, is baby steps. It was just like delisting the wolves. You know, you're not going to get everything you want, but you got to have some kind of a starting point. And the bipartisan support that this bill received is a starting point. So is it the best solution for right now? Maybe not, but it's a start. So we'll, we'll just kind of see where it goes is, from. Is this changing the wording of a constitution? This is what the, I, I've heard this. Well, we're going to add trapping to the constitution along with harvesting. Well, let, let me uh, read the actual bullet from the Constitution, then we'll, we'll use that as a starting point. Because a lot of people don't know. Maybe if you're not invested in trapping or harvesting animals, you might not know this. Uh, this is Section 7 of the Montana State Constitution. Um, quote, The opportunity to harvest wild fish and wild game animals is a heritage that shall forever be preserved to the individual citizen of the state and does not create a right to trespass on private property or diminution of other private rights. So there you so, go. Yeah. Uh, there so you go. basically, that, my understanding is that 212... It leaves out predators, it leaves out non-game animals. That, it says specifically, game animals and fish, uh, game fish. Uh, that is quite specific, and I, I'm sure that if this hits the court, and you can't change the wording of the Constitution with a law. It wasn't meant to change the Constitution, Mike. I think where the where the miscommunication is it adds the word trapping as a means of harvest and in the constitution it discusses harvest so yeah. whether it's a rifle or a bow now trapping is recognized as a means of harvest and that's really what the intent was yeah, on that particular bill yeah i i just don't think it'll stand you know i i just think when they had a chance to put it add and put it a constitutional amendment to cover trapping yeah. and they bypassed it simply because none of them ever read the read the constitution is a little, a little, because I did a survey with this, some of these people, and everybody was in favor of, hey, let's put a damn thing on the ballot, but that wasn't going to happen. All right. Thanks, Mike. Oh, yeah. Bye. Appreciate the call. All right. 721-1290, uh, 1-800-568-5309, if you have a question or comment. Bill Merrill joining us, the Montana Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife. Now, aside from that, what other kind of stuff are you guys working on? I mean, the legislature's over now. And so uh, uh, on a daily, on a weekly or a monthly basis, do you guys have a, like a list of goals, things you work toward um, throughout the year? We do. Um, you know, we, we started out really as a, uh, as a organization to help uh, get the wolf delisted so we can manage predators and help the, the big game uh, herds in western montana and montana in general right and i remember now. that i remember uh when you were here before in previous years that that became a multi-state almost a national effort right it was a national effort i stood on capitol hill with david allen of the rocky mountain elk foundation and miles moretti with the mule deer foundation and legislators from montana wyoming idaho utah uh, to testify about what was going on and um, Senator Tester uh, was one of the guys that kind of helped bring that about. And I didn't feel the Tester bill was as good as the Reberg bill, but it was baby steps. We weren't going to get everything that we wanted. But since then, we've seen the, the season on the wolf get longer. We've seen trapping introduced as a means to take wolf, um, electronic calling. So a lot of things, uh, you know, five years on that have come down the pipe are really where we wanted to be. And we're, we're finally starting to see an uptick in some of the game herds, especially around Yellowstone. This is the first time in almost 20 years that the elk herds around Yellowstone have shown an uptick. So we're pretty excited about that. But having said that, you know, that was just one thing we've done. We're really involved now with getting youth uh, into the field getting them off the iPad and the iPod and teaching them how to draw a bow or cast a line. Hey, so. let, let's get to the phone and uh, get Rich on the line. Rich, good morning. Hi, how are you? Yes, um, about all of this with the deal, um, there was a, a law passed this year about uh, silencers and stuff. And yeah. I'm curious, why would they do that and not approve lighted knobs? It, it really is uh, dependent upon what groups back what. 
And some of the, the, the diehard archers out there, from what I understand in the archery community and the traditional archers, they say, no, we don't want lighted knocks. But, you know, they want to be able to use a GPS to figure out where a corner crossing is. So I think it's not getting all the right people in the same room. Everybody's well, maybe gonna, it sounds like technology in baby steps as well, right? It, I think it is. I mean, it's, it's certainly understandable. Lighted knocks are approved in many of the other states. It doesn't give you any kind of an advantage to harvest a game animal. It lets you put the arrow on the string in it, the dark. Yeah, and you can find it. You Thanks know, it, call, helps you, it helps you track them. So, and, you know, personally, just speaking from a personal standpoint, I think lighted knocks are, are not a big deal. I think it helps in the recovery of the game animal versus losing that animal at night. I think you make a great point. I think it's stupid to not be able to have lighted knocks. I mean, yeah, we, we have people out there with a rifle. Right, you're not going to have some huge advantage with the bow that you wouldn't have with a rifle, even um, if you had lighted knocks and heat sinking technology. I mean, <laughs> hey, no, we're, up, we're up against a break, and when we come back, I want to get more details on your big event coming up. So, because that's the reason you're here in the first place. That's right. Talk about the big pig roast, and uh, we're going to come right back. By the way, we have all three lines open, and by the way, in the nine o'clock hour. We're going to be visiting with, with a an economist with the Fed. That's right. Oh, boy. Fed economist. <laughs> okay, we'll be right back in a moment. Oh, what a uh, lovely dink <laughs> Here in the studio, we do have Bill Merrill, who's joining us, Montana Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife. I've got about, got about three minutes. So uh, if you would fill us in on the facts and the figures, I know we just heard the commercial, but hey, live live stuff is always better. So uh, tell us what's going on, when and where. It is. We're really excited. Uh, it's our sixth annual pig roast live and silent auction. It'll be at the fairgrounds in the uh, home and uh, home arts building there in the Missoula County Fairgrounds. Starts at 2 p.m. on Saturday. We'll have a fishing pond for the kids, games and activities. So it's a very, very family-friendly event. We'll have a couple uh, smoked hogs that will be brought in by Superior Meats. The food at this event is second to none. Um, we gave away some tickets earlier on uh, Kiss FM with Billy and Shireen. $25 for adults. Uh, kids 12 and under eat for free. So it's a, it's a fantastic event. We'll have uh, guns, bows, art, uh, trapping supplies, outdoor gear, um, and you can pick it up for pennies on the dollar in the silent auction. Well, and Dad should know this little fishing pond is, there's a special surprise in the pond, right? Yeah, what we do is we tag uh, we tag a couple fish in the fishing pond, and if the uh, young the lucky youngster that catches that particular fish, we have some uh, Remington Bold Action twenty two or a, a similar type rifle for that youngster to get them uh, out in the field uh, plinking at cans. So. Um, and I, I do believe dads might be able to hold that for that youngster until he's uh, passed his hunter safety course, John. So I would encourage you to get your, your pole, but let's just keep the power bait out of the fish pond, okay? <laughs> That's all right. Just need one piece of dynamite. Um, the, uh, the question I had for you about uh, the kids. Okay, this net. Is, I know you guys are big, big proponents of getting youth out into the field, getting young hunters in Absolutely. there. Absolutely. What, what age do you think kids should go out and start shooting for the first time? Uh, mine started at eight and there's been some bills in the legislature, um, you know, the apprenticeship hunting, which unfortunately for the second year uh, died to have children be able to go out and hunt with a, a licensed adult or a parent or a guardian. Um, it's legal in 33 other states, but Montana, we just haven't made that corner yet. But, you know, I started mine early. They were shooting bows at age three. Um, my son got his first 22 this year at age 10. And under proper supervision, right place, right time, I think it's it's great for them to go out and learn the fundamentals of shooting and especially casting a rod. I mean, we've, we've been fly fishing since we were three or four, me and my little guy. So if we went back 200 years, these kids would be killing their own food. Absolutely. <laughs> or they wouldn't be here. That's right. That's how we made it. Yeah, so. yeah. Okay, so if folks want to get more information about uh, Montana Sportsmen for Fish and Wildlife, where do they go? What do they do? They can go to our website at mt-sfw.org, or they can look up Montana Sportsmen for Fish and Wildlife on Facebook and like us there. Uh, they'll, they'll get a lot of information, actually, what we've done in the legislative session on Facebook as well. So we're, 
we're we're all over the place now. Fantastic. Bill, always a pleasure. Come back next year. Thank you. We appreciate it. All right. Excellent. All right. It's Bill Merrill. And uh, that's going to do it for this hour of uh, of Talk Back. We have uh, another Montana World Affairs Council on the radio deal because of this big energy conference that continues today at the University of Montana, the Mansfield Center. We're hoping for a guest in studio. I believe it's going to be Rob Grunewald, who is a um, actually an economist with the Federal Reserve. So we'll be talking with him. Fingers crossed on that, and uh, we'll continue with talk back in the nine o'clock. Okay, it's been a busy couple of weeks. Uh, Bob Seidenschwartz is getting frequent flyer or frequent driver miles uh, back and forth from his office to our studio. Yeah, it's it's like a bad dream. I just keep coming back. <laughs> it just and won't go away. There's no groundhogs anywhere. <laughs> no. Uh, but Bob Seidenschwartz joining us here in studio. The, uh, the, the special editions, if you will, of the Montana World Affairs Council on the radio continue. John King, I'm Peter Christian. Bob and our guest, Rob Grunewald, is with us today. Right. All right. right. Uh, so, uh, Rob, welcome. Rob is here from Minneapolis, and uh, he works for the Federal Reserve. Now, can I can I embarrass the poor guy no, with his No, please bio? give him a little background. Okay, yeah, all right. For so, the audience. It, like, luckily, I can't see him, so he's going to get all red faced. Yeah. All these awards and stuff. Anyway, Rob Rob Grunewald uh, conducts regional economic research and co-authors the Minneapolis Fed's Beige Book Report on current economic conditions. He also writes articles on the regional economy and other economics and banking issues for the Fed to Gazette and the Regent to Periodicals, published by the Minneapolis Fed. Grunewald recent, uh, regularly speaks to business, community, and school groups about the Federal Reserve and the regional economy. He co-authored Early Childhood Development, Economic Development with a High Public Return, in January of 2003, an economic policy paper, which has been featured in the media, legislative hearings, and seminars throughout the country. He serves on the board of directors for the Minnesota Visiting Nurse Agency, Resources for Child Caring, the advisory board for First Children's Finance Growth Fund, and a secretary for the Minnesota Economic Association. All right. So, welcome, sir. It's good to see you. It's great to be here in Missoula. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep I, up, I can't see jumping you. up and down so I, I can see you. All right. So, uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, your experience so far you presented yesterday at the at the uh, energy uh, forum so what what did you talk about and who were you with so the energy summit today and and uh, also held yesterday bringing together leaders and experts through in the energy markets that not only represent up here in the northwestern parts of the united states uh, but also from countries across the ocean in china japan and korea and it's an opportunity for leaders to discuss energy policy, uh, but also to understand technology and different changes that are happening in the different types of energy that we are all uh, needing. And, excuse me. One of the, uh, I've been attending a number of the sessions, and one of the takeaways, which to me really stood out, is people are very heartfelt. They're very articulate. They're able to give a very... Um, insightful understanding of how complex the issues are and what needs to be done. But what I see is matching desires and actual implementation are two different things. I I didn't hear anybody saying, I want dirty water, polluted (laughs) air, and, uh, you know, we want to keep extracting resources that are possibly having negative effects on the environment. And there was a lot of passion at the conference, but I'm, I'm listening to this, I'm going, okay, but you need to look at, you know, one thing that we've learned is as we set down this, as we set down this course, the unpredictable happens over and over again. So as much as we plan, there's an aspect here that seems to never quite let that line be a straight line to, to the you know, end result. The whole idea is to be nimble, though. I mean, I mean, you have to be ready for anything, especially if you're administrating these types of things, right? Well, and that's the one thing, too, that I think is very important is that having a diverse energy uh, Let's, let's just call it the menu that the United States has right now and will continue to develop is probably one of the most critical things we can do in order to be, be, excuse me, order to be prepared uh, for things that inevitably are going to change. And that's one of the things that you look at other countries, you realize that they have very singular type of energy resources. So um, I'd like to have our, our guest comment. Go ahead, Rob. You're uh, up. It is true that the energy mix that we have and also – uh, what's important to this region in terms of over on the eastern part of Montana, we have development of oil and gas. We also have coal here, but also renewable energy in terms of wind power 
and being able to have all of those resources available and understanding what the most cost-effective measures and most efficient ways of using those different technologies. There's also uh, one of the panels that I attended is looking at how to be able to use the energy, of particularly in, our, let's say, our electrical grid, in a very smart way. That is, to be able to use technology to see where we could reduce use uh, during peak hours so you don't have to pull on some of those more expensive energy sources and perhaps uh, more polluting energy sources during, let's say, the heat of the summer. And as we can implement technology and use our electrical grid in a smarter way, that's a way uh, that we can be more efficient and effective. Now, isn't that exactly what we talked about yesterday, right? Right. We had a couple of guests on that were talking exactly about this issue. Um, and, I, and I'm asking myself this question. I put this out there to, to, to us here. W- what are the steps that have to be taken? In other words, is there some entity that's looking at this in its entirety that then gives advice or insight? Or are we kind of all acting in separate ways kind of working towards the same end, but there's no kind of clearinghouse, per se. Well, I mean, this is what I'm learning about, too. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm as much of a student at this conference as I am a presenter. And, and there's a couple of pieces that drive energy, and one is the markets right. or the demand for energy, where that's happening not only here in the United States but around the world, and the supply of the different sources of energy and the technology that makes that supply available. So markets are going to be driving uh, signals around demand and what type of resources to bring in. But policy, uh, being able to direct policy at a high level to look at the long game. So what are, what are those resources that we need to have available that maybe market signals right here in the short term are not going to provide us that answer. So having some vision and saying, okay, these are resources we need, some renewable resources we're going to need in the long run. We want to make sure that those are being developed. We're going to take a little break. Catherine's on the line with a couple of always very good questions. But uh, my question for you, when we come back, uh, when, when you look at, uh, you had mentioned, is there some group or entity that's going to help try to guide all this? Right. I wanted to ask uh, Rob, would you prefer that that, uh, whoever is going to be in charge of that, would it be a Warren Buffett-esque type deal where the markets are everything? Or like the EPA or some government organization, some government entity that's going to take things a different direction. So I want to find out from you, because you work with the Fed, uh, what your idea uh, might be on that. Or could it be some sort of hybrid of the two? So, And if we're going to come right back and get Catherine's questions. We have two lines open as well. 721-1290 is our number. We'll be right back. We're back on TalkBack. 721-1290 is our number. 1-800-568-5309. Bob Seidenschwartz joining us here in studio, the Montana World Affairs Council on the radio. Big, big, big energy conference going on at the Mansfield Center at University of Montana. Now, if you could, uh, uh, well, let's go back to Rob, because I asked you a question. Uh, we only have you for an hour, so I'm going to milk you for everything we can. I asked you a question uh, uh, that Bob brought up. Obviously, it would be nice if there was some sort of guiding force with all these various I- intervening variables that are coming up with energy. Would, would you prefer seeing a private sector deal like a Warren Buffett or some sort of organization like that or the, uh, uh, some sort of federal agency uh, basically standing behind trying to guide things? As far as energy goes. Okay, so I'm going I'm to first disclaim that I'm not an expert on all of these issues, but from what I've seen, what I've learned from this conference, is I'm going to answer with the word yes. Okay. Uh, that there's a role for both. <laughs> uh, that, we, that markets are going to be driving signals for what energy is in demand and, and how to use it. But having some policy uh, guidance in terms of making sure that we are uh, that we're using clean sources, that we're meeting regulations, all of this is important. But I also don't want to point out that there's important roles for markets within how regulation can work. Uh, for example, if we can be able to price uh, those items that, that we're concerned about for society, for example, carbon, if we are able to develop a price uh, for carbon and develop ways to be able to trade carbon so that companies can look at their impact there and understand what is the, what is the most efficient way uh, that we could produce or trade those uh, carbon credits or those prices of carbon um, from an economic standpoint, just from a theoretical and also an applied standpoint, that sometimes developing ways to put market signals from not just a regulatory framework, but actually putting it in that trading system now there, can be a way to go. There is a phrase I haven't heard for a long time, trading carbon credits. Now, Back uh, 2008, 
there, and I, and I have personal experience with that since a family member was the chief operating officer of the first attempt in the United States to develop a carbon exchange. And things were moving forward, and there was a pricing mechanism. Companies were starting to sign up. Things were starting to happen. Then we had the economic crash, and that market just completely collapsed. And we haven't seen a revitalization of that. So these things have been attempted in terms of uh, putting some mechanism in place. And to Rob's point, which, which I've heard continually at the conference, particularly with the uh, business uh, component, we need, to need, we need to know the rules of the road. As, as an operating business that's going to make capital investments for a long-term return, we want to have a sense of what the regulatory environment is going to be. Is it going to change? How do we adjust to it? So to your point, um, these are some of the things that some centralization may bring to the equation. Okay, well, let's get Catherine on the line. I know you have some good questions. Catherine, you're on with Rob Grunwald. Go ahead. Uh, good morning. Okay, let's see if I can put these together here. Uh, in the U.S., inventories of products are at an all-time high, according to what I've read. And so I'm curious as to what influence is this going to have on the U.S. economy going forward uh, with regard to the energy needs. And couple that with uh, the fact that across Europe, um, especially, the G7 is uh, carrying approximately 120% of public debt, uh, which is the rate of the GDP, and there's uh, a lot of the country, countries, starting with the Swiss, have gone into a, a negative bond yeah, interest rate um, for, their, for their government bonds. Um, 50% or 70% of German bonds are negative uh, interest rate, 50% of French and 17% of Spanish. Yeah, we talked How about that with Arnie Sherman a couple of weeks ago, right? right. Yeah, so go ahead. Yeah, so I was curious, uh, because energy is fungible, of course, across all uh, countries, um, how, uh, how is the energy market going to respond to that? Does that, is that how is that going to affect the U.S. energy market in particular? Okay, thanks, Catherine. Go ahead. Okay, Bob, Rob, <laughs> anyone. Well, Catherine, <laughs> as always, uh, having you here is like having the economist in front of me. So yeah, it's, really, uh, yeah. Th there's... Some areas I think that Rob is uh, comfortable in answering, and this may not be possibly one of those. So I would suggest, Catherine, give me a call at the office, and I can give you some info <laughs> on, on these issues. But uh, please, John. I, I think that uh, if you're not comfortable answering that, I, I think it is a good opportunity to ask, oh, what exactly is your specialty? And what exactly the, the, the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank specializes in? What sorts of issues do you look at at a daily basis? Do you try to predict and do you assess? Sure. Thanks. And, and to, to Catherine's question, just to, to let folks know that uh, during this, this time when we're very close to a policy meeting back in Washington, I, my comments are only about today about the energy and also uh, this particular question here of uh, what we're looking at here in the Ninth District in terms of energy. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis uh, covers Montana, the Dakotas, Minnesota, and the northwestern portion of Wisconsin, Upper Peninsula of Michigan, very large area up here on the northern tier. And compared to some of the other Federal Reserve districts, we have lots of agriculture. It's very unique there, too. But we, all have, we also have a strong presence of natural resources and mining. So with the, the development of oil and gas development, in the Bakken area in North Dakota and eastern Montana, uh, we're taking a very close look at how that development has happened over time and the impact on those communities over time because it's one of the fastest developing areas that we've seen in the country for some time. And so on our website, we like to keep track of what's happening in terms of economic development indicators in the region, and also understanding what's happening now that uh, oil prices have gotten a little bit lower. Okay, we're going to take a little break, so go ahead, Bob. As I say, we can answer uh, Catherine's question to one extent with the continuation of this conversation, which is what happens as a result of oil prices dropping. We have too much supply versus demand at the moment, so we've seen a precipitous drop, and when we come back, Rob can talk about some of the effects on the Bakken in the region. You bet. We'll be right back. We have all three lines open. If you want to visit with Rob Grunwald, he works with the Minneapolis, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, and, and uh, we're talking about the energy conference going on at the University of Montana at the Mansfield Center. Uh, any questions or comments? We'd love to hear from you. 
Hey, we're back on Talkback. 721-1290 is the number, and uh, we do have a caller on the line. Wants to visit with Rob Grunwald uh, with the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank. Well, let's get uh, John on. John, thanks for holding. Go ahead, sir. Good morning, uh, Mr. Grunwald. Uh, you sound like a, a, a pleasant uh, conversationalist. Um, I feel a little betrayed, however, that uh, John, Peter, and Mr. Seidenschwartz didn't give you a, a the opportunity to answer for yourself what areas what areas of your expertise you're able to share with us, and I I really didn't learn much that I haven't already heard on the program, so I just like you to hear some some new information. I think. What what exactly are you looking for, John? Uh, some hard facts on um, what it is um, Mr. Grimald's experience can bring to the table. Okay. We're just sort of beating around the bush here on what's going on with the economy and oil. And uh, I don't know. I, I guess well, are, 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 oh, for, forgive me, but are you are you looking for something that the Federal Reserve is going to do to try to influence what's going on, or or what? I, I'm I'm really forgive I, me. I, I'm I'm genuinely confused by your question. Okay, I'm confused by why bring on a, an expert in the field of economics, banking, or I'm not sure what 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 the expertise brings to the table here. Uh, that's what I'm confused about. Okay. So right. I don't mean to confuse you. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's easy to do. <laughs> People do it every day around here. But 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 thanks for your call. We'll ask him. So go ahead, uh, Rob. Yeah. Uh, so just to be clear, the what what my expertise is for this conference. So what I came to this conference to talk about is the economic and community impact of the the Bakken oil and gas play and how that uh, that has changed the whole region. Uh, so for example. Uh, at the Fed, we look at a 12-county area that takes nine counties in western North Dakota and three counties in eastern Montana, including Sheridan, Roosevelt, and Richland. And we look at the impact of the tremendous growth in oil drilling beginning back in 2005 uh, when oil drilling started in, in Richland County. Uh, we saw that pick up until we hit the Great Recession. There was a drop and then started slowly picking up again. In those regions, we're seeing in some parts of North Dakota, the, the population tripling and quadrupling. Uh, tremendous stresses on the ability of folks there to plan for that development in such a short and fast time period, needing all the infrastructure that you would need, not only for oil and gas development, uh, including pipelines and roads and being able to uh, transport all of that oil to uh, hubs to send on trains and pipelines, but all for the population as well. So the, the development around residential housing, uh, what cities have to do in terms of planning uh, for water systems, schools, child care, you name it. So that's a, it's a dynamic that we've been watching allow me to over ask time. You, let me ask you this. Uh, whenever I talk to anybody about the Bakken, and especially people who actually live in that area, I, I hear two words, boom and bust. And, and unfortunately, uh, in areas around Montana, there have been boom and bust cycles, you know, whether it's gold or silver or copper or whatever it might be. So obviously the Bakken has been going through a boom. Uh, so is this lower energy prices... Is this the signal of the beginning of a bust? In other words, would all, all that's happened there in the Bakken, eventually people just get up and leave because, uh, because of the oil prices are not rising? So what, what we're noticing in the Bakken is that there is a, a drop in the number of oil rigs that are working in the area. It's, it's uh, dropped uh, from a peak of a, around 200 drilling rigs just a couple of years ago. Uh, now we're down to below 90 of these rigs. I just heard that in Montana, there is not a, a particular active rig, but it's, Montana's right on the edge of all the activities. So certainly that part of, of the state is still active in, in that oil play. So what oil companies are doing is that they're focusing on where they can produce oil at break-even prices that are low enough to be profitable. And they're drilling uh, wells on areas called pads and it, sometimes there are over 20 to up to nearly 30 wells per pad because with the new technology, hydraulic fracturing technology, is that oil companies are able to drill to different depths and also to move out horizontally in different directions. And that gives them the opportunity to be able to reach uh, more oil in a given area. So you'll see a, a map of these drilling rigs are fairly concentrated 
uh, right now in places where oil companies are are able to do that most cost effectively. What we're also noticing is there are some layoffs. Uh, certainly, oil field workers have been laid off, and but there's still a lot of growth and development in the region. So. While a worker might be laid off from working on the rig, they'll have a chance to be able to find a job in construction, uh, working on developing some of the infrastructure in the area. So we haven't seen what you would call a bust activity. Uh, yeah, I wanted to focus in on that. I did the story uh, yesterday with the head of the Montana petroleum industry, and he was the one that told me that they shut off their last rig on the 23rd. Uh, so there are currently no rigs uh, drilling new wells in Montana. Uh, and each rig would drill between 8 and 12 uh, wells a year, he said. Uh, but because we don't have any drilling, in the future, there's going to be a decline in production. And he also gave me some of the numbers, which I might be able to pull up in a second here, about how much economic benefit comes from each individual well, which was shocking to me. It was a lot of economic benefit. John, did he say that was a short-term situation in terms of the drop-off in production due to the pullback in well? He deployment? said it was because of the drop in pr- petroleum uh, right. that, that 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 drop had really shut down everything and i looked at the statistics for the united states i think we had like 3500 uh rigs going as late as november of last year we're now down to 200 since november of last year montana dropped from what had been a four-year constant of around 13 to 14 rigs drilling to zero within the space of nine months so that may not trigger what would be a shock yet but each of these, you know, it's a little bit of a long-term investment. You'll start to feel it when the wells dry up and there's no new wells to replace their production. Um, so I'm wondering, my basic question to you is, this insight, this is what we know as far as what new wells are being dug. Are we going to feel the pinch here at the end of the year or next year? The Montana Petroleum Industry guy said that we would start to feel it at the end of this year. But my question to you is, you know, how do you judge what's going to happen economically in the future based off of this information? Okay, we're going to have a man to that when we come back from the break. Patty and Merrill are also waiting to visit. We have a line open, 721-1290. Rob Grunwald with us from the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Uh, back with more. We'll get that answer to John's question in just a moment. Hey, we're back on TalkBack, and uh, it's a Montana World Affairs Council on the radio, and we're having a lot of those because there's a huge energy conference going on right now at the University of Montana at the Mansfield Center that is sponsoring. Bob Seidenschwartz is with us. Rob Grunwald is joining us. Now, John just brought up some some things uh, that uh, Dave Galt with the Montana Petroleum Association uh, brought up to him. We had a big news story about it this morning, about the uh, uh, rather alarming decrease in production in, in wells in Montana. So if you could address that, Rob. You know, certainly with, with the production that's been happening and each well, uh, we have a drilling rig that's in operation and it's been estimated that relative to that rig, uh, that that's effectively producing employment for 100 or more uh, jobs connected to the rig and also support jobs and so on. Uh, there's also a tax revenue that comes to states uh, from when uh, we have that production and, and certainly what we notice about the production scale and trajectory of shale wells is that they produce very strong early, um, but then they, that production tends to cut off. Even though they'll be producing for 20 or 30 years, uh, once you get past the first couple of years, it's a, it's a lower level of production. Uh, so there's, there certainly is an economic impact here. Uh, it goes to show that here we are in North Dakota and Montana, and we are affected by global conditions. Uh, the supply that has come online from the United States using this new technology uh, has helped to bring prices down. Uh, OPEC has taken a position uh, where they're going to continue to produce, and and basically uh, with those lower prices, are expecting that those uh, shale drillers that were more on the margin uh, would decrease produce production, and they have. Also, it's been slower uh, growth overall around the world. Uh, China's been slower and and so that makes for lower prices. But these, as we noted at the beginning of the program, things can change. And if you have some stronger growth globally, uh, those prices can come back up. There was a very important takeaway uh, at a presentation that North America, Canada, the U.S., and Mexico are becoming the energy producers. In effect, OPEC is shifting to North America Mm. looking forward. This is part of what I suspect the Saudis are also concerned about in terms of staying relevant, maintaining their position, whether OPEC is what it is today in the future. 
Who knows? But the production coming out of these three countries is shifting the global energy production. Okay, let's uh, let's get to the phone and say, uh, Patty, first of all, thank you for holding. You're on with Rob Grunwald. Go ahead. Hi. Well, Rob, um, what I'm really concerned about is um, what do you think the purpose of oil is in the earth? So in terms of uh, maybe expand on that just a little bit more in terms of the... Well, maybe holding the planet in space without any strings attached. Ooh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was just a lubricant to keep the rocks happy, but uh, that's, it's... All right. Patty, uh, that's getting out there and, just a little and bit. And another thing, who's going to be financially responsible when we start having earthquakes? that we had right here in Idaho about two weeks ago, a week and a half ago. There's no fracking in Idaho. immensely in Oklahoma and uh, from fracking, and they kind of just, that can do a lot of damage. And we've got Yellowstone right here, which we really don't want to upset that apple cart. Gotcha. Right. So, uh, Patty, uh, this might be interesting to you. I did an... Int- uh, an interesting uh, news story last week was it Peter? Yeah. Mm-hmm. With the uh, for the call with Mike Stickney, he runs the earthquake lab at MSU. Uh, actually, he's out of Butte, sorry, and Montana Tech. And uh, so they've been studying this earthquake phenomenon. You were right about Oklahoma fracking has produced a lot of low level earthquakes in that area, but Montana tells a very different story. Um, he should know. He watches the seismod- size size seismeter or whatever you call it seismograph. Thank you. He watches this thing on a regular basis. And in Montana, Montana's fracking industry, there's two that might two small earthquakes that might have been caused by fracking, but it's on a fault and it's a place that does go off, so it's not even sure that it has. And they don't know why, but Mon- the way Montana does fracking doesn't seem to be impacting the earth in the same way that other areas have. And one of the theories for that, uh, that Mike told me, is the way that they store the extra runoff, whether or not it's stored below or above where they're drilling. And uh, apparently they do it reverse in the Bakken compared to the other areas, and we're not seeing the same effect. So even if earthquakes are a result of some types of fracking, there might be workarounds where maybe we're learning from our activities. Yeah, there's, a, there's a learning curve there. So uh, uh, did, anything else you want to say about that? No, Rob? just that there's a lots of eyes on what's happening in Oklahoma and uh, being able to try to understand that seismic activity. Okay, let's get Marilyn on real quickly. And we got about a minute before a break. So Marilyn, please go ahead. Yeah, um, I have a dream that the free market would actually be able to work. Um, the federal government, the Fed is connected with the, gov- the, Fed, the government and Warren Buffett, he's not free market. He's been connected with the government, too, and that's called fascism. I don't really think that the, this industry has been able to really go the way it has, should be able to, and we would be energy dependent. I mean, Saudi Arabia and Russia, they're all, they're all in this, too. I mean, you brought that up a little bit. So what would it look like if the free market and not politics... Uh, Politics were out, and the free market would actually be able to work. Okay, let's ask him. So uh, what do you think, Rob? Is, uh, is it, uh, If you could remove government from the mix, would things get get better and everybody would get rich and there would be more jobs? What, what do you think? Well, certainly markets are an important way. You know, here we are in a market economy uh, for us to distribute goods and services and for families to make income and so on. But with any market, we, we need to look at how well those markets are working. And economists always looked to see, you know, is there anything in that market in which there might be a spillover uh, that might be negative or positive, for example. And in energy markets, we want to make sure if there's any spillovers from development of energy, such as pollution is the main one that we look at, uh, that that's accounted for. And that does take um, some type of regulation and also accountability. And some of that happens within the industry, making steps to produce in a cleaner way. And some of that comes from a, a regulatory framework, making sure from the government side uh, that, we're, that we're, it's clean. You're up against the break, so John, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add in. I looked up what I had learned, but I'd forgotten. Uh, we store at the Bakken, they, they store the excess uh, fracking materials above where they're drilling. And in Oklahoma and elsewhere, they usually store it below where they're drilling. And it's just a theory right now, but the theory is that that's what uh, might be the difference in why we don't have earthquakes in the Bakken. Okay, so we're going to take a break. Come right back. Rob Grunwald joining us from the uh, 
Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. We're talking about the energy conference at the University of Montana. All three lines are clear. They're all open. If you would like to make a comment or ask a question, give us a call, 721-1290. Hey, it's Talk Back, and it's Thursday, and it's absolutely gorgeous outside. And uh, we're talking with Rob Grunewald. Of course, Bob Seidenshorts joining us this morning from the Montana World Affairs Council. Big energy conference going on in the Mansfield Center on the U of M campus. John, go ahead. Yeah, this is a Facebook post from Mitchell. He says, uh, there was an excellent article a number of years ago in Wired magazine. They had a grid explaining what price a barrel of oil had to reach before a new technology would become viable. Uh, For hydrogen, it was $200 a barrel. Oil sands, it was $80 a barrel. So uh, is that something you kind of track? Does the price of oil influence other developments in associated or alternative energies, that sort of thing? So it's it's something I don't track... uh, you know, intensively, I've been, we've been looking more at the price of oil and the impact that it's had on, on more immediate production. Uh, but certainly you can look at any type of oil technology, I mean, energy technology, and understand if uh, oil prices reach a certain threshold, it now becomes profitable to start develop, uh, you know, this other means, you know, f- for example, even hydraulic fracturing. Uh, this was a technology that was not profitable when we had oil prices at $25 a barrel and even $40 a barrel. That, that price needed to get higher in order for there to be an incentive for companies to start to invest and develop that technology. Now, certainly when we, when we look at the oil prices coming down as they have, uh, for marginal producers, that has come down to a point where it's put some of, it shut down some of those rigs uh, but it's also forced those rigs that are still working uh, to find ways to produce even less expensively. Uh, oil companies are going back to their vendors, they're asking for some price reductions. Some of the very high wages that have been paid to some of the oil field workers yeah, yeah, yeah. and to some of the you know some of the support folks like truck drivers in the Bakken region, we've heard anecdotally so no more uh, that those have been no, bid no down more, somewhat. Yeah. No, so that, no more $20 yeah. an hour for McDonald's workers, right? Well, but that's <laughs> the market, though, really, in, in terms of a question one of our callers asked. That's really the market then acting and adjusting without a regulatory environment or some type of somebody saying, you've got to do this. This is just how business tends to ex- extract and, and expand. That's certainly. I mean, businesses are going to be responding to those. Right those uh, price points. And, and, and so we're, we're seeing that they're even, they've always been working at trying to be as efficient as possible because that increases their, their profits. But now there's even a, a stronger emphasis and they have more leverage. Uh, oil companies do look at, at that oil price and then when they come back to a vendor and say, hey, this is where reality is in the market right now, uh, Bob, what can we do? Dur- during the break, Bob, Bob brought up something that uh, I, uh, it just seems that entrepreneurs and uh, idea people, people who build things, invent things, are always running way ahead of government regulation and even of the markets. I, and with fracking, it was the same deal. I, I like to say the, the price got up to the point where fracking became uh, economically viable. So the fracking revolution began. And now I was going to ask you, and I'm not even sure if this would be your bailiwick, uh, Rob, but uh, is, is, are there any technologies that you've heard about while you're here in this conference that are poised to do the same thing that fracking did 10, 15 years ago? I mean, are, are, are there uh, energy uh, sources that perhaps the Fed or the, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis looking at that may be, you know, viable things to invest in in, in the future? You know, that's a, it's a great question, and I've not been at the, the right sessions to be able to okay. you know, point at that leading edge. But I will point out that um, some of what I mentioned earlier in this call, some of the, the technology, because, we, because we're able to now collect big data and be able to use that data in an effective way, uh, some of the ways to be able to regulate our electrical usage uh, going forward uh, do seem quite promising. There were several things, uh, and a lot of it hinges on what we're already discussing, innovation. And the fact that markets react very quickly to be more efficient because of price control. So one of the things we had talked about earlier, and we really haven't brought this on air, is what makes our culture maybe unique in this country that is able to adapt to scenarios like this versus, say, Japan or Germany or other countries which uh, don't have the flexibility or the historic kind of entrepreneurial ship that really drives the U.S. Look, it could be coal, nuclear, natural gas, solar, wind. All of these things are moving forward. 
in some capacity and fashion right now. Well, they have to. And they have to. Yeah. And technology, uh, to the point of fracking with prices coming down, 10 years ago or even five years ago, where solar advancement was, would not be competitive compared to where it is today, even with lower oil prices, because of advances in pricing and efficiency that has been able to make solar a more competitive product. Okay, with that, we're going to come right back. We have a one-minute break. It's our final break. We have all three lines open. If you want to get a final question in for Rob Grunwald, joining us here this morning from the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, we'd love to entertain your calls, or or if you want to make your fa- uh, your point on Facebook, you can do that as well. We'll be right back. Solar panels. Hey, we are rapidly running out of time here. That's what happens when we have interesting guests. Rob Grunwald joining us from the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, uh, part of the uh, Energy Conference going on, uh, Energy Summit, if you will, at the uh, University of Montana. And Mike, you are on. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. Um, for some of your listeners who are concerned about the environmental impact of fracking, um, they there are some scientists that think that hydroelectric um, the reservoirs behind hydroelectric dams, since they're all located in the northern, most of them, the giant ones are located in the northern hemisphere, are actually changing the axis of our spin on our planet. So <laughs> it seems that no matter what, what we do, um, we're going to alter the environment. You just can't win for losing, can we, Mike? No kidding. <laughs> yeah, don't, 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 don't me tell Al Gore, please. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> okay. Um, um, the question, the Federal Reserve, um, how independent are they um, with whatever administration is serving? It seems, uh, I know the president nominates the head of the reserve, uh, Janet Yellen, and then uh, she's confirmed. But then how, mu- how much say-so does an administration have on fiscal policy, on whether it's tight or not? Okay. And uh, is there too much coziness? Your guest could, I don't know if he can answer it, but is there too much coziness between the Federal Reserve and... He looks like a coziness expert, let me tell you. All right. (laughs) All right. Thanks for the call, Mike. So what what do you think, Rob? Yeah, just again to remind, for the the scope of this conversation, uh, because we're very close to a FOMC policy meeting, I'm not commenting anything on monetary policy or where economic conditions are going for the U.S. But just to give some background about the structure of the Federal Reserve, uh, the Federal Reserve has our Board of Governors, the chair is Janet Yellen. Uh, the Board of Governors and the chair are appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate. Uh, and that they're the governing board of all of the 12 districts. And so the Federal Reserve is accountable to Congress and to the United States people because in the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, it was laid out what the responsibilities for the Federal Reserve are. Which are what? They include monetary policy, so we're not involved with uh, tax and spending or mm-hmm. fiscal policy. So we are responsible for the flow of money and credit in the economy in such a way as to keep prices stable. Uh, right now, the Federal Reserve does have a 2% inflation target and also to achieve a full employment in the economy. So it's a dual mandate for monetary policy. The Fed is also uh, responsible for being one of our bank regulators in the economy. The Fed oversees the entire system of payments, making sure that that payment system is efficient and sound. And we issue Federal Reserve notes. So Federal Reserve notes are out there in the economy as they're issued by the Fed. And we are the bank uh, for the federal government. So while the Federal Reserve is not part of the federal government, we are an independent bank with responsibilities uh, to uh, the United States and to the people of the United States. Is it an uneasy it, cooperative effort, or is it something that you've been able to to co- uh, coexist peacefully with the U.S. government for? Uh, you know, because I can imagine that there are forces uh, moving on on the Fed from every direction, saying, "Please do this, please don't do this." I mean, how do you remain independent? Well, throughout history, you know, in the United States with the Federal Reserve and central banks around the world, there's always. Uh, making sure that that central bank is performing its functions sound and is in the context of a larger uh, political reality. And so part of what the Federal Reserve is charged with doing is reporting to Congress officially twice a year uh, before uh, congressional committees, uh, but also many times you'll see uh, Federal Reserve officials making sure that uh, we're providing information about uh, where policy is going. And in fact, you can 
you can look and see after every policy meeting what the Federal Reserve has well, to say about it. Like now, I, I happen to know, because I do a real estate show, realtors love you guys, right? <laughs> and they have for the last several years, because interest rates are low, making it more attractive for people to buy homes. So, you know, I mean, that's they, they think it's great. They, now, then they know it's going to go up eventually. They don't know when. I, nobody really knows. Uh, but But there's a lot of folks out there that are appreciative of the fact that interest rates are low. It doesn't help folks who are trying to live off savings, but there's got to be a balance there, right? That, that, so this is just one of those things that I'm a little bit too close to a policy meeting okay, to I'm actually sorry, comment okay, I'm on. Sorry, I'm sorry. Everyone's <laughs> trying to get you away from what you came to talk about, so I'm going to jump back on. <laughs> okay. uh, you deal with ripple effects we have in two the Bakken. We have only two minutes, but I wanted you to go into one of the things that maybe Montanans hadn't heard of, one of the side effects of the Bakken boom or uh, the the situation there that maybe we haven't thought of, uh, the interrelations between that economy and the rest of the economy in Montana. Sure. And so one thing we look at is what economic activity is happening right in the Bakken region, but also what, hap- what ripple effect does that have? In terms of aggregate data, unemployment rates, employment, wages, and so on, we do see that within 100 miles around that Bakken region that there's some, there's some impact. We see a correlation between activity in the Bakken right out there. We don't see it going two, three, four hundred miles away in aggregate data. Certainly individuals are affected, state coffers are affected, uh, but we do note uh, that the activity that's in the Bakken is, uh, is happening there. It's really affecting that particular area. Uh, but for example, Minnesota recently released a study that impacts there are relatively modest uh, to that state economy. So basically, it, it has a, a graph really high here, and then it levels out the farther away you get? That's correct. Okay. All right. So if folks want to get more information about the, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Minneapolis, is there a place they can go to find more information? Rob? Certainly. Uh, just go to our website at the Minneapolis Fed, Fed Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. It's also MinneapolisFed.org is our okay. site. All right. And we have a, a page right on the left-hand yeah, side called the Bakken Oil Boom. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate it. Sorry to get you into dangerous territory there, but well, we appreciate being with us. Thank you very much. All Enjoyed right. it. Now, Bob, uh, what's going on? We have less than a minute, so what's going on There's today? still a number of sessions that are open to the public for your charge. Uh, I would ask them to go to the Mansfield Center site and see the listing of the different uh, discussions and panels that are available today. Conference will end at 3 o'clock. And, Rob, thank you very much for being our guest today. All right. It's, it's been a pleasure. And listen, that's going to do it for uh, for uh, Talk Back this morning. But tomorrow, obviously, it's our one-hour show with the uh, Catching the Big Ones from 8 to 9. And then, of course, we have Talk Back from 9 to 10. I'm assuming it's going to be open phones. Well, I don't know. It sounds like Peter's going to ditch me tomorrow. So i got to oh. come up with a backup plan. <laughs> I have to leave at 920. So. Yes. So uh, anyway. John doesn't want to talk by himself for an hour. We'll see what he comes up with. Yeah. What? <laughs> Bob's, Bob's telling me he might be able to help out. Bye-bye, everybody.